Um, but I want to start dealing with some things relative to the empowerment of women. Um, you know, I was I was challenged, and I and and you know, periodically I am. I'm challenged by <clears throat> certain brothers that not most now. The, the the you know the beautiful thing is that ninety ninety eight percent of brothers really appreciate what I do and uh, support it and endorse it. And sometimes they even invite their significant others to join in and to listen to what I'm saying. They buy my stuff. But then there, there's a certain minority of brothers that say, well, why, you know, why is it that you, you spend all this time uh, talking, empowering women? And uh, one brother said, what was, what was the words he said to his, uh, I don't think it was his girlfriend or somebody. Uh, he said to her, uh, I don't like listening to him because he's breaking the man code. Because, you know, in the father-daughter talk in the book, uh, the book is not about, um, you know, it's, it's really written to women. A lot of folk think it's written to men. Men do read it. They can benefit from it, but it's written to women. And it's a father's perspective on life and how a woman, what a woman should know, how she should carry herself and, uh, and the like. And it exposes many things that most women are not privy to. And as a consequence of not being privy, uh, this is where we run into the situation with, as I call it, PhD women that are manipulated by GED men. It's because you're playing a game and you don't even realize it. So the brother said, well, with the stuff I'm, I'm putting out there and the stuff I'm teaching, he says he's breaking the man code. So my question was, well, what is the man code? Is the man code that uh, as men, we are to keep all of these devices to ourselves and, and continue to lie to generations of women and continue to break the hearts of women and never grow up, never evolve into real manhood. And, um, Apparently that is that was his perspective, but I said uh, that a true man code starts, you know that you're a man, you know that you've evolved and grown into manhood when you've come to a place where you desire to protect womanhood. And if you're truly a man, if there's such a thing as a man code, uh, there has to be a father code. So as a father, I feel responsible for my biological and my spiritual and other people's daughters to teach the truth relative to what women are dealing with in society. And so, you know, of course, that shut the conversation down because it's generations of men that continue to be silent about what women are dealing with that perpetuates generations of broken women. Um, and I often say that men are, when you look at the world and history, men, we are the dispensers of pain while women are the containers of it. We put it out, women embody it. And so I believe that we're in a time and in a generation now where God is raising up, um, raising up men as fathers, as brothers, as honorable men to really begin to heal the wounds that we as men have created through lies. Exactly. We have created these wounds and now I believe that God is raising up generations of men to bring about a healing balm of truth to those, to those same wounds that we've created. So tonight I want to talk about the evolution of a broken woman. You know, a woman that, um, a woman that starts out in a certain place, but then she is designed by God to end up in a excellent or greater position. Some of you are on here tonight, you, you know, you're in a position now where you're broken. And the first thing I would say to you is do not believe that the story ends where it is. 
do not believe that the story ends where it presently is. You are in process. You know, it's kind of like, you know, you look at, you look at a broken woman, a woman that has been abused, misused, heart is, heart is aching, life has been torn, it's tattered. And many times we conclude that this woman is all she'll ever be. Not understanding that that woman is in the process of evolution. God is using all of her history to formulate her destiny. God is using all of her pain to generate her power. Yes, even discriminated against. Um, you know, it's kind of like you look at an assembly line, watch this, you look at an assembly line and if, if this is the beginning of it and this is the end of it, you should not judge the product at this point because it's not fully evolved yet. And many times we, we look at women who are on the assembly line and they're at this point and we judge them and we conclude that they are what they presently are and that's all there is to them. And the reality is that God is using all of that stuff to bring them to this point under construction. Now, let's look at something. Let me see if I can kind of recap the lesson I taught at uh, Women of Excellence. Uh, in, in Proverbs 31, 29, in Proverbs 31, 29, the Bible says, Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. And the thing that I brought out in, 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 in this lesson is that, you know, the ideal evolution of a woman, the ideal evolution of a woman is that she is born, she is identified, meaning she is claimed, she knows who's, who, who, who's, who she belongs to, she knows who her father is, she knows her heritage, she is protected and nurtured, she is esteemed and ultimately shaped into a queen by an intentional father and an intentional mother. And this brings her into this Proverbs 31 status where Many have done virtuously, but she excels them all. That's the ideal evolution of a woman. She is born, she is identified, she is protected and nurtured. She is esteemed, ultimately shaped into a queen by her father and her mother. But how many of you that are on here tonight understand completely that the reality in life is that all women are predestined queens? Listen to this very carefully. Every woman is a predestined queen, but most women do not travel the ideal path. Most women on their journey to queendom, as we might call it, come through many trials and pains and even emotional setbacks. Most women do not have the ideal of well, born, identified, protected and nurtured, esteemed and shaped. Most women do not travel that path. But here's the reality. <clears throat> you may be broken by life and what it has thrown at you and what life has pulled you through, even drug you through, but you are none the less queen or no less queen. Just because you're broken does not mean that you're not queen. Just because your path has been difficult does not mean that you are not queen. And the Holy Spirit showed me that there's, there is a mass healing of the souls of women. It's going on now. It's happening even now. I believe this is a great reason the Lord has, has caused me to, is, is, has caused me to rise up even with this message. I didn't even know what I was doing when I, when I started teaching that sermon series and wrote the book. I didn't know what I was doing. I thought I was just going to do something, nice message, and I'll move on to something else. I didn't know that it would become a staple in my ministry and that I would uh, literally travel the country teaching this message. 
and that women from all over the country and or even from other parts of the world would gravitate to me and view me as a spiritual father and would take my counsel very seriously. I didn't know that. But I believe it is the timing of God that God is bringing a healing to the souls of broken women. God showed me, you know, I, I saw this vision of a solid crown. Now listen to this very carefully. I rarely have visions, but I saw this vision of a solid crown. And the crown was a fraction. It was as if some blunt object had hit the crown and disfigured the, 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 the ideal shape of the crown. And the Holy Spirit asked me a question. He said, is the crown less valuable because it has been fractured? I said, no, it's solid gold. It is no less valuable. It just needs to be repaired. And then he asked me another question. Is a broken woman less queen because she's been broken? Wow. I said, no, she just needs to be healed. So there's, there's my gender. But so most women do not come by way of the ideal path. If you have some sisters that need to hear this, Invite them to come in tonight. Most women do not come by way of the ideal path. Most of you that are even watching tonight and will watch the rebroadcast of this, you are broken. You've been broken by so many things. You've been broken because your fathers were not present. You've been broken because you lack paternal instruction. You you entered into adulthood as a young woman, making all kinds of blunders and mistakes that left your heart uh, feeling almost destroyed. You, 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 you've made some errors that may have slowed you down but have not stopped you. You're broken. So most women rise, listen to this carefully now. Most women rise through the reality of a thing called the father wound. Development, what is the father wound? It is development without the benefit of a father's input or protection. You know, I was looking at, I went to, I had to go to Chicago yesterday or Friday. Was it Friday? Yeah, Friday. I had to go to Chicago Friday. My youngest daughter, who's at DePaul University, and she's a double major, and, and uh, one of her majors is theater. And so she had the lead in a, in a powerful play, and I had to be there. It was the last night of it. And um, I was looking at how this girl, this child, I call her a child, but she'll be 20 years old very soon, this young woman, I was looking at how she went into school, never had a misstep, no problems, grades excellent, no, no, just no issues at all. She manages a, a, a big, dangerous city like Chicago with the utmost confidence and wisdom. I'm looking at this girl and I'm like, wow, you know, my wife has done a marvelous job. I'm looking at her. And then the Holy Spirit reminded me that this young woman is the product of what it looks like to be a young woman who's had a father that has been intentional about her development. God Almighty. And, and I thought about the millions of women who've not had that in their lives, but rather have had this void. And the first thing I want to say to you tonight relative to that is... Even when your biological fathers have not been present, you have to understand that God has a means of subsidizing that need. And sometimes, as my daughter uh, Carla Cannon would say, God will send the substitute. And you have to learn how to receive the substitute. Sometimes the substitute is your pastor. Sometimes the substitute is a... Is a it's an older, older gentleman on the job that is just taken to you like a father. 
But because you've not had the father, you don't always know how to receive. You don't always. I have I have daughters in my in my ministry that I love dearly, but they don't know how to receive. It's unfortunate that I can go all over the nation and women gravitate to me and they receive my. But every woman doesn't know how to receive. Now let me get back because I'm getting off track. How does a queen evolve from a life of pain? How do you become, how do you become queen? How do you rise to the throne when your present condition is the gutter? And not the gutter in sense of your character, but the gutter in sense of your condition, your predicament, your present state. Not your character, but where life has caused you to land. How do you rise from how do you rise from the gutter to the throne? When you've made you made blunders and mistakes, and it's left you at the lowest place, at such a low place you never dreamed you would be here. How do you rise from that and make it to the throne? Where do you find the crown in the mud? Well, number one, let's see. Let me let me let me say this before I get into when you do not have when you when you've lived a life when you've had a life of pain as a woman and you've not had the the, the affirmative relationship of a father and society has done everything it can to rob you of your greatness the woman's first inclination, listen to this, is to pretend that she is what she's not. And this I, I termed as, I have a few things that I've termed, I termed this as mascara therapy, where you paint up the outside to cover up the ugliness on the inside. In Psalm 51 and 6, it says, Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. God desires truth in the inward parts. But most modern women are dressed up on the outside, but broken on the inside. I see it all the time. I see it all of the time where, where women look, they look fabulous. And man, it's a wonderful thing to see a woman that takes care of herself, you know, from an external perspective. But it's even greater when she has an internal to match. But most women who've been broken, they dress up the outside and they ignore the inside. Well, number one, lest I keep you too long tonight. The evolution of a broken woman. Number one, number one, point number one. How does a broken woman evolve into her crown? How does she evolve into her throne? Number one, somebody has to alert her that she is queen. Somebody has to tell her. Somebody has to tell her. Because queens are queens long before they realize it. Somebody ought to write that somewhere. Write it on your mirror. Queens are queens <clears throat> long before they realize it. Somebody has to sit them down <clears throat> and explain to them who they really are. That's the whole purpose of queenology. I hope to take and to speak into the lives of a multitude of women and let them know for the first time you're queen. Queens are queens long before they realize it. And in Romans 12 and 2, it says, Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Somebody has to renew your mind to understand your true identity. That you are greater than your present condition. 
Number two. Number two. Number one, somebody has to alert her that she is queen. Number two, the woman must dispose of the painful residue of an unfortunate history through forgiveness. Somebody wakes you up, shakes you, says, hey, you're queen. I know you're in the gutter. I know life has thrown you some tough blows, but guess what? You're a queen. Here's your crown. Wear it. But now watch this. The woman has to dispose of the painful residue of an unfortunate history through forgiveness. You cannot rise to the throne as long as you're shackled to the gutter through unforgiveness. That's all unforgiveness does, is it shackles you to the gutter. If you hear what I'm saying, if you, you need to write that somewhere. That's the Holy Ghost. Because that's a, that's a picture that cannot escape your mind. Unforgiveness shackles you to the gutter. It shackles you to the people and the experiences that you detest the most. And for the queen to rise to her throne, she has to dispose of the painful residue of her past history, her painful history, through forgiveness. Because watch this. One of the greatest hindrances to the evolution of queens is baggage baggage is carrying too much stuff bag lady your ascension is hindered because you're carrying too much stuff you got this man you're angry with you got that man you're angry with you're mad with your children's father you know, your children are nearly grown. You're still angry with your children's father. You're mad with your daddy because he didn't teach you this and he wasn't there for that. And you're mad with your mama. You're mad with everybody on your job. And this baggage is hindering your ascension. You're going to miss your bus. Hebrews 12, 15 in the Amplified reads like this. Glad to see Dr. Felix. Glad to see Dr. Felix here tonight. Hebrews 12, 15 says, exercise foresight and be on the watch to look after one another. This is an amplified version. To see that no one falls back from and fails to secure God's grace, his unmerited favor and spiritual blessing in order that no root of resentment, rancor, bitterness, or hatred shoots forth and causes trouble and bitter torment and the many become contaminated and defiled by it. When you allow unforgiveness to rest in your heart, it is poisoning your destiny. Somebody has to awaken you and tell you you're queen, but now your responsibility is to dispose of all of the residue of that painful history through unforgiveness. You know, where, you know where you're destined to go? Now let go where you've been. Did you hear what I just said? You know where you're destined to go. Now let go of where you've been. Glad to see my daughter Desiree here tonight. Uh, let me see. Number three. You must eliminate everything that shackles you to your present condition. Now, this kind of bleeds out of point number two. But in Hebrews 12 and 1, it says, Wherefore, seeing about, we're compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. He says, let us lay aside the weights and the sins that beset us. 
there are things in your life as a queen that will hinder your rise. Sometimes these things are relationships, habits, uh, anything that would hinder you from going to the place that God has predestined you to go, you have to release it. You got to eliminate everything that shackles you to your present condition. What is it that is preventing you from evolving? What is it? Is it a mindset? Is it, is it, is it a personal character flaw like laziness, like procrastination? What is it that's hindering you that's, that's, that is hindering you from rising to the level God is calling you to? Number four. <clears throat> Number four. You must possess. Now this is it. And I'm done. I'm out of here. I'm gone. You must possess the audacity to be queen in spite of the hand you were dealt. You know, the devil will tell you, oh, you know, I hear that man talking all that talk, but you know where you've been. You know what you've gone through. You know what your history is. You know what your reputation has been. You know what you've done. You know how many children you got. You know how many daddies, baby daddies you have. You know, you know, you don't have this. You don't have that. You're not educated enough. You don't have the da 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 da. You got to, you got to develop the audacity to be queen in spite of any kind of hand you've been dealt. What is audacity? Audacity is boldness. It's fearlessness to step into your purpose in, in spite of opposition. You know, if you want to find uh, an audacious woman, uh, go and find that woman that broke into Jesus' uh, meeting there. And she, she broke in there. She broke the rules, I put it. This woman broke the rules. She, she went in with her alabaster box dropped down at his feet in the midst of all of these men, started crying on his feet, started wiping his feet with her hair, poured that oil on him. She broke all of the rules. And if you're going to rise to the place that God is calling you to, you're going to have to come to a place where you have the kind of boldness and fearlessness that you're willing to break the rules. If it's not broke, break it. Glad to see my son, Pastor D. Sometimes you got to break the rules. For you to be queen, sometimes you got to offend somebody. Sometimes you got to care nothing about what people think. Sometimes you got to break the rules. I'm out of here. But if you look in Esther 4 and 16, it says, she says, go gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan and Fashi for me and neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. I also and my maidens will fast likewise. And so will I go in unto the king, which is not according to the law. I'm getting ready to break some rules here. Esther says, and if I perish, let me perish. For you to be queen, you have to come to a place where you have the audacity to be queen in spite of opposing opinions. Doesn't matter what people think. Doesn't matter what they say. When you know who you are, when you know who you are, and watch this, as you take on the boldness to step into what God has called you to be, what happens then is the Holy Spirit creates a new comfort zone for you. In the beginning, it'll be a little uncomfortable, you know, but as you, as you step into it, the Holy Spirit will create a new comfort zone for you. And you become comfortable in that crown. You get it adjusted. And you get situated in your throne. But you got to have the audacity to sit on it. You got to have the audacity to put that crown on. And what happens is you really awaken to who you've always been. You awaken to who you've always been. The devil tried to tell you that you were limited to the gutter. You were limited to the, to the bottom. You were limited to this or that. But when you develop the audacity to step into what God has called you,
you then realize this is who you always were. My God, my God.